so let's begin. Um, just to start, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, so his name is Ali Abdullah Saroya, and he graduated in 2015 from PEA. He went on to study aeronautical and astronautical engineering at Purdue University. And since then, he has worked at Collins Aerospace as a systems engineer, aero and thermal fluid engineer, and more. Currently, Mr. Saroya is a thermal analysis engineer at Boeing and is pursuing a graduate degree. All right, thanks, Ria. And thanks to the you know, Vertex team for inviting me. And you know, hi, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, actually, hold on. Yep, share. And let's, boom, start. So really, um, as uh, Ria mentioned, I graduated from PA in 2015. I started relatively, I'm relatively you know, new in the aerospace uh, industry. So it's not like I'm some village elder from on high that can give you like 40 years of experience and tell you everything and anything about how aerospace works. This is at least the way I want to uh, go about this is essentially one person's journey into aerospace engineering, the sorts of things I've seen in the industry so far, what my observations have been, and maybe general bits of advice or information that I could share with you because you know I recently graduated from college. I've sort of seen how things have sort of uh, been run recently. So I think of it as more of a uh, singular perspective uh, on very a very interesting, complicated, uh, you know, industry. So again, uh, I graduated from PA in 2015. And, you know, uh, and as I mentioned to Diego, I believe I lived in Main Street Hall for all four years. Um, just to give a little bit of history, right? Uh, on that top picture there, I think is me in October of 2011, uh, you know, obviously successfully, uh, you know, uh, making us offshore of ice cream from the D Hall ice cream machine uh, obviously went super well. You could also see that um, I was wearing a tie back then. So until I believe the fall of 2015, uh, there was a requirement that extra students had to wear ties. I think that's not the case anymore, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, also, like, when I went to Exeter prep year, they shut off the internet at 11 p.m uh every day by prep winter and spring they decide to give us 24 hour, hour internet access and this was nice because by the time i was working on my 333 right i could you know cite my sources in real time as i was working uh at 4 a.m for maybe the 17th time in a row it was it was very useful um but it was an interesting sort of uh transitionary period, uh, both for the school and for the, my for my life personally. Um, there are probably a lot of things I could talk about, you know, regarding my time at Exeter, um, you know, the brilliant and driven students from all over the world that you went to class with, played sports with, lived with, um, you know, the amazing teachers that are there. But I'd say that, you know, one of the most interesting lessons that I got there, you know, the one lesson that I really carry with me to, to this day is that, you know, to learn, to build great things, to become a better person of yourself, really, it's, you know, really not about trying to be the smartest person in the room or proving that you're better than everyone else. It, at least in my personal experience, Exeter taught me really, really, really fast that there are things I do not know, that there's always a higher limit to reach, and that there are other people around you that know things that you don't. So really what Exeter taught me was that, you know, to achieve great things and to really do good in the world, it takes the humility to acknowledge the skills and stories of other people and the proactivity to collaborate and build new possibilities together. The world is, you know, too big and too complex to tackle alone. So having the ability to communicate your ideas to others and to listen to what others are saying is necessary to address the challenges of today. Um, 
to be honest, I knew for a long time that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. So after Exeter, I became an aero student at Purdue University. And here I got a lot more involved uh, technically. Um, did a lot of technical work at the student club level, academically, through internships. And as Rhea mentioned today, I find myself as a thermal analysis engineer at Boeing in St. Louis. Um, but let's, you know, roll back a little. What is it that, you know, a thermal engineer actually does, right? So let's draw a bit of a picture, right? Imagine, you know, any aerospace vehicle, right? You know, you could have, you know, commercial airplane, fighter jet, missile, rocket, um, anything, right? Um, air at high speeds is going to uh, heat up your rocket. Electronics are going to generate a lot of heat. Aircraft engines, all this stuff generates heat, a lot of it. You know, as a thermal engineer, what I do in a nutshell is make sure that heat is properly managed so that the aircraft doesn't freeze, melt, or burn out of the sky. Um, fun fact, if you've, uh, some of you might know this, uh, if liquid oxygen ignites um, metal, you know, the structure of a rocket, right? You know, aluminum, steel, whatnot, it actually is very good fuel. And so like the moment you get a spark in the wrong place, you could find your entire rocket essentially just burning up, like not even just melting, just burning because the oxygen is just going to react very violently to it. So as a thermal engineer, I have to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen. Um, why did I choose aerospace engineering? Well, to be honest, at the core of it, um, I really like rockets and airplanes. As a professor, Purdue uh, said one time, um, most the reason why most of you chose to be aerospace engineering, as he's saying this to us, right, is that you wanted to make airplanes instead of washing machines. But you know, if I think about this more philosophically. In my eyes, um, when I think about aerospace, you know, I think about how commercial aviation has made the world smaller, how satellites have made our lives easier with navigation and by allowing us to, you know, talk to face-to-face -to -face with relatives across the world. And I mean, sure, of course, there's uh, uh, fiber optic and that cables as well, but uh, uh, even the Zoom call might in some way be facilitated by the satellite infrastructure that is uh, in space right now. I remember 10 years ago, uh, we used to have those like scratch off uh, um, uh, payphone cards that my parents would use to call my grandparents on Pakistan. Now it's as easy as, you know, opening up Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, uh, you know, Zoom. A lot of things have happened uh, in the industry and even beyond Earth, space exploration has allowed us to explore the far reaches of the solar system and see places that we've never been before. Basically expanding our collective knowledge beyond anything we had uh, at any point in history. You know, the way I think about it, right? And maybe this is a little cliche, it's basically a field for achieving the impossible. It's a field for big dreamers. And maybe this is a bit of a shameless uh, Boeing plug, right? But I actually do think, uh, that message, uh, you know, is pretty eloquently communicated by this video, at least more eloquently than I could communicate it. We're down there, right? Are they down there? No, Rohan's still alive. Uh, Rohan, what? Rohan's that way in the back. Practice room and they're down there, yeah. Who's there? Uh, I don't know. David and? The same dude that told us not to run? Uh, okay, I'm not sure know. if you're sharing your audio. Oh, oh, you can't. Um, uh, do you want to screen the video? Say that again. Oh, do you want to full screen the video? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, let me. Um, hmm. Hold on. I thought I could click the YouTube, click the YouTube link. Yeah, I'm going to click the YouTube link. Okay. So let me know. Uh, da, 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 da. let me new share YouTube share. Boom. Boom. Perfect. And let's go. Let me know if you hear it now. Oh, could you share the audio? Ah. Um, it's at the top bar in the like the green bar at the top. There's like yes. the three options. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, can you hear the audio now or no? I'm not sure what, the, what it's supposed to be, but hmm. Okay. This is interesting. 
Uh, Don't worry, it's Zoom. We have to embrace the fumble. That's fair. Hmm? We have to embrace the fumble. That's what my physics teacher always That's says. That's fair. Um, hmm. So say that again. So new share. Um, and so what options? The green bar at the top that says like screen share. I'm yes. screen sharing. Yes. On the view options on the side, there should be an option that says share audio. Uh, so this would be, I'm not sure I see the view options. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm so sorry. Don't worry. Um, yeah. Do you see it? You know what, let's, let's, let's skip this uh, video for now and move on to some other things. Um, that's okay. Uh -huh. I'll, if we need to share any videos, I'll just share them with you and then you can uh, stream them if that's uh, all right with you. Yeah, of course. You can just go through sure. and send me a link in the Zoom chat and I can take Sounds it. good. Cool. So, ba -ba 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 -ba, boom, boom. 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 So, well, cool video aside. Um, I think uh, I want to start by you know saying that you know Igor Sikorsky uh, has said this quote I forget how many decades ago you know aeronautics was neither an industry nor a science it was a miracle um, and I think he says it quite well when he says that aerospace is really nothing less than a miracle because think about it for most of human history you know the skies were pretty much inaccessible to us they were in the human imagination the domains of birds gods. Uh, we dreamed of ourselves up there. We wrote stories and mythologies of people take, uh, getting their wings and taking to the sky. But in reality, we were rooted to the ground for pretty much most of human history. You know, that more or less changed uh, in you know, 1903 with the Wright Brothers' first flight. And ever since then, that has sort of catalyzed a brand new era of human possibility. You know, over the last 120 years, we've joined the birds in the air and reached travel to the reaches of space far beyond what our ancestors could have dreamed of. Um, aerospace engineers, at least, this, is, this may be sensational uh, in the way I say it, but it almost really isn't. We kind of are the modern Daedalus in a sense, using science and technology to give humanity its wings. So to ground ourselves a little, uh, pardon the pun, sorry, uh, a good technical definition of aerospace engineering is as follows. You know, aerospace engineering is a field that concerns itself with the design, development, construction, testing, and operation of vehicles operating in the Earth's atmosphere or in outer space. You can roughly divide uh, aerospace engineering to two disciplines, although, to be honest, these lines blur very easily. You know, you have aeronautical engineering, the development of vehicles that travel through the air, and astronautical engineering, uh, development of vehicles that travel uh, into and through outer space. Um, hold on. What screen am I sharing, by the way? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, let me help with that. Yeah, got it. Sorry. Uh, yes, there we go. And sure. Boom. So, yes. So, it's, you know, it's a field concerning itself with the development of vehicles that travel into and through space. So, we use, um, a lot of different disciplines, it's, you know, fluid dynamics, structural mechanics, controls, propulsion, amongst other disciplines to build vehicles to reach as far as the edge of the solar system, to take people across the world in a matter of hours, and to land people on the moon even. You know, it's a field that pushes us to the limits of technical capabilities and compels us to find creative solutions to break new frontiers. It's a massively dynamic field that relies on the talents of people in many disciplines. You know, mechanical engineers, software designers, artists, builders, policymakers. It takes really a lot of hands to make some of the most complex machines on the planet work. And, you know, to make these, you know, once impossible dreams, you know, that, you know, people 500 years ago wouldn't have even imagined uh, a reality. So from what I see, in an already very, very interesting field, right now, if I was to think about it, uh, 
there's a sort of confluence of technologies that are emerging that makes aerospace engineering, that makes right now actually one of the most exciting periods in the history of aerospace engineering today. You know, the ongoing development of commercial space flight is making space more accessible for science and exploration. The emergence of CubeSat technology makes it so that instead of needing hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, in the power of a nation, um, you know, it used to be that, you know, a handful of countries, Russia, the United States, China could actually send satellites to the sky. You know, a high school or college class can realistically build and develop science experiments and satellites that can be sent to space. And we're seeing the return of supersonic commercial flights in the next decade. We're sending flying rovers to Mars and to a moon on Titan, uh, or uh, the moon Titan, it's a moon on Saturn uh, that we believe has uh, signs, the, that believe, we believe has uh, signs uh, of life. And we're actually in a period of our history where we can start exploring uh, very tan uh, tangibly whether we're alone in the universe. We're witnessing a revolution in robotics and autonomous systems in aerospace engineering as well. If you've ever you know, seen uh, the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy land, uh, right? Um, maybe you've heard this analogy before, but getting those rockets to land uh, is almost like throwing a pencil up the height of the Empire State Building and having it land right on the eraser head. Um, and that's basically done you know, autonomously. Um, today, you know, cargo airplanes, uh, we have the technology to, uh, to uh, allow you know, cargo airplanes uh, to you know, basically fly themselves from takeoff to landing, um, really every phase of flight. Autonomy, I, in my opinion, is going to be the future of aerospace. Um, it's going to get more and more um, prevalent in our technologies, in our uh, means of travel, et cetera. And at least from a technical sense, it's already arrived. It's a pretty, pretty crazy period to be in aerospace right now. And to be honest, it's only going to get more wild to come. And you know, th there's a lot of things I could probably share, like a lot of different examples that showcase just what sort of things are being done. But to nail this point home, I want to showcase maybe a couple videos that show, you know, a small slice of the kinds of strides the aerospace industry is making. And the first thing I want to show is uh, a video on the Ingenuity helicopter, which uh, is the first drone on Mars. And hold on, let me go ahead and share the link. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, copy and boom. There you go. And just to save some time, I'm going to also share the next link as well. Uh, on hand just to show that you can do it. Okay. okay. Is everyone able to hear that? Yeah. Perfect. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin compared to Earth. At Mars, it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400, 2,600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy 
it has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground, and so we will basically go up uh, about three meters, and we'll hover there, uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it'll fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle's performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now, and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk, and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. So I'm just going to drive now, uh, if that's all right. Oh, would you like to share the next video? Uh, no, 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 no. There's one more slide that I want to show before the next video. OK. Sounds good. OK. And boom. And, uh, current slide. Uh, let's let me share. To share. Boom. So the first flight of the Ingenuity helicopter was uh, in uh, April 29, 2021. Hold on. Let's see. There we go. So if you see the GIF running, uh, this is actually real footage of the Ingenuity helicopter. And this is actually its 13th flight. So if you remember uh, from the video, this mission was designed to run for about 30 days and maybe five flights at most. So it is doing much better than expected and is basically zooming around to this day right now. Um, as they mentioned, you know, the Martian atmosphere is about 1% as thick as that of Earth. So just even getting off the ground is a massive challenge. And right now they're just basically, you know, playing with a drone on Mars, getting it to do all sorts of maneuvers. Uh, uh, throughout the Martian surface. And actually, if I recall correctly, uh, the next flight for the Ingenuity might be as early as tomorrow. And because the Ingenuity is so successful and giving us so much uh, scientific data for uh, future missions, NASA has uh, uh, elected to extend the vehicle mission duration indefinitely. So, you know, just like Curiosity, which is also designed for a relatively short period of time, but ended up, you know, running for 15 years, you know, we might see something very similar with Ingenuity. You know, over the, over the next few months, maybe even over the next few years, Ingenuity could still be flying and giving us a lot of valuable data to look at for future missions. You know, for an example, a little bit closer to Earth, right? Um, so you know how I mentioned that autonomous planes are pretty much already here uh, and that the technology is basically uh, at our doorstep. Um, commercial airplanes have been implementing autonomous control schemes on portions of flight for years now, like auto land, um, auto takeoff, even like portions of flight where you can just uh, you know, have the flight computer run uh, the main uh, 
cruise duration. Um, we're at a point where an air, airplane could functionally pilot itself. The technology is already here. And at this point, really, the main challenge now is ensuring that this technology is safe and that um, the public uh, gains acceptance and comfort with the technology, which is why um, vehicles like the X-Wing, which uh, I'd like to show a video of here, is so important. So um, if you want to uh, play the next video, Rita, um, that would be great. Autonomous aviation is coming. It's going to revolutionize the way people and goods move around on a regional level. It's going to introduce a new mode of transportation that's going to change the way society uh, functions in general. And at X-Wing, we look to lead the charge in that area uh, by developing some of this key technology to make it happen. We bring together people with deep, deep expertise in unmanned flights, and we pair them with some of the best software engineers that the Valley offers. It's this mix of talent from different industries that I think has the highest likelihood of creating successful outcomes in this space. X-Wing's autoflight system is really the brain and muscle of the aircraft. It completely replaces what a pilot does. The autoflight system is able to wake up the aircraft, uh, to turn on the system, to taxi the airplane on its own. Through radio relay, we can talk to air traffic control to get the right clearances. The autoflight system makes the aircraft take off on the runway fly through the airspace, brings the aircraft, lands, taxis back all the way to the gate, shuts down the engine. Um, all that without the intervention of, uh, of a human. The market that we target is the cargo feeder market. It's going to be one of the first applications for unmanned flights in the industry in general. Confining our initial unmanned operations to cargo over uh, unpopulated areas allows us to sandbox you know, these initial commercial operations in a way that puts the regulator at ease. that make the X-Wing auto flight system stand out from the competition is that it does full airspace integration. All the coordination with air traffic control with other aircraft, dynamic planning in the air and on the ground. Additionally, the system is designed to be platform agnostic, to be able to be installed in, in any type of aircraft. It allows full autonomy of, of the entire operation. We're trying to do something here that really hasn't been done before. There's not a playbook for how do you certify autonomy in aviation. It just hasn't really been that mature to this point. So we are working very closely with the regulator and with other industry bodies to figure out what the right path is. I think there's nothing more exhilarating than having your baby or you know, effectively our aircraft do its initial uh, maiden flights. Sitting in the airplane when everything is coming to uh, to an end, I should say, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, feeling of pride for, for the entire team. So we look to fill the last remaining gap in the transportation network. It's going to connect local communities uh, better than ever before, and that's enabled by the technology we develop here at X-Wing. Oh, awesome. I think you're on mute. Yes, I am. So now I'm going to share my screen again. So let's say like me, uh, you think aerospace engineering is super cool and something you want to do, right? Um, a question that, you know, I asked myself, uh, you know, early on and maybe uh, what a question that some of you might be asking yourselves is what sort of things in school can you do? Um, you know, right now, you know, um, 
I know a few of you are involved in robotics uh, and other uh, technical uh, oriented clubs and whatnot. That's, you're doing a lot of the right things uh, right now. And it's a lot of stuff that will serve you quite well in air, as aerospace engineers in the future. And even then, you know, um, I admittedly uh, at Exeter didn't uh, involve myself too much in robotics or engineering related clubs. And to be honest, that's fine. You know, even starting with, you know, a more holistic or uh, humanistic background uh, is still very valuable in engineering. And there's more than enough opportunities uh, in college to really sort of deep dive into this stuff. So I'm going to focus on some of the cool things that you can actually look forward to in college. And, you know, some of the stuff that I'm showing here is basically a small snippet, uh, really. So in the top right, uh, you can see a student built uh, RC airplane that's being flown for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, AIAA, uh, Design Build Fly Challenge. It's you know, a design challenge um, that's run every year. We're much like any robotics challenge or competition, right? You have a set of tasks that you need to design an airplane for and compete with students all over the country to showcase your skills and ingenuity. You know, on the bottom left, uh, you'll see you know, a bunch of students setting up a fairly large model rocket that will fly in the Mojave Desert in California. And you know, of course, they have a bunch of neighbors like Strata Launch, Virgin Galactic, a lot of you know, big players in uh, the suborbital launch, uh, uh, the growing suborbital launch industry that are pretty much right there. So you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of cool uh, people even as a student in that respect. Now on the top left, uh, you'll see uh, a student and a professor. I think this might be at the uh, Aerospace Science Labs at Purdue. Uh, they're performing an electrical check on a CubeSat that uh, a student team built to uh, demonstrate a novel water jet propulsion system for small satellites uh, that will go to orbit. Um, it's a technology demonstrator uh, that's on the very cutting edge that you know students, uh, undergrad students, are actually working on. And on the bottom right, uh, this is probably one of my favorite pictures. Uh, is uh, a rocket engine test stand at Purdue University's Zucro Labs. So talking about Zucro specifically, you know, there's technology uh, from SpaceX, Blue Origin, Department of Defense, legit cutting edge technology from some of the biggest players in the aerospace industry. Um, we're talking aircraft uh, engines, rockets, you know, subsonic, supersonic, hypersonic, it's all being tested there and a lot of the test stands are set up and run by students. You know, students not much older than uh, you guys, to be honest. And, you know, just because I want to shamelessly advertise myself, right? Uh, the middle is me uh, with a bunch of members of an engineering team I was on after we presented a concept for a flying passenger vehicle, you know, flying cars, the, that sort of thing, uh, to NASA at the Glenn Research Center. Um, which was maybe like a few examples here, but again, there's honestly dozens, hundreds of more things you could do at colleges and universities all, all over the country. Uh, and that's not even to mention all the internship opportunities, research opportunities that you'll find in industry. Now, as a student, you could really get your hands uh, on cutting edge technology of the future pretty early in your career. You don't necessarily have to you know wait for some horizon that's super far away, you can get yourself involved very, very quickly. And just to really, you know, talk a little bit more about some of the things you could do, I want to, as an example, showcase, uh, uh, as an example, my uh, aerospace engineering senior design project, just to show a little bit of what sort of thing you can do in specificity. Um, so in a team, in a nutshell, in a team of 30 engineers, uh, which I was a part of, we designed uh, a liquid rocket to reach the Karman line, which um, is the internationally agreed upon uh, boundary of space, which is about you know, 100 kilometers uh, in the atmosphere. Um, student groups from all over the country have been working to design, build, and fly rockets to become the first student org to reach that barrier. Because from what I understand, from I think, yeah, even now, I don't think any student organization has ever actually built a rocket to achieve this. Um, 
as for me specifically, I was actually part of the electric turbo pump team for this project. So just to give some context as to why this is significant, let me back up here for a second to explain some stuff a little. You know, rocket engines um, need some way for propellants to uh, be flowed from the tanks into the rocket combustion chamber at the very end uh, and through the nozzle. And it needs to be at high pressure and uh, a decent flow rate so that the engine can actually generate thrust. So in order to get these high pressures in the chamber, you need, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so in order to generate uh, these high pressures, you could do a couple of things. You could um, have very high pressures in your tanks, um, which is a way that smaller rockets uh, achieve uh, good thrust in the chamber. But the problem you'll find is as you make your rockets bigger and bigger, and you need more and more pressure, you'll find that your tanks get very, very heavy. So once you get to you know uh, suborbital stage rockets, which was what we were doing, or like orbital stage rockets, which you know space shuttle, what uh, the Falcon Nine, etc., uh, the tanks become too heavy to actually really fly. So what most uh, uh, what most rockets do at this point is use uh, turbo pumps, uh, which are lighter, uh, but they end up being a lot more complex mechanically. Um, to make our lives even more interesting, uh, we decide to use electric motors to drive the pumps. And you know, just to explain a little bit about why this is interesting, only maybe what one or two other rockets in the industry, like just actual professionals uh, making rockets, right? Only a couple other uh, rockets in the industry actually make this technological choice. So for us, this was actually an opportunity to try something very uh, technologically risky for the sake of learning something interesting. Um, and so what was already a difficult challenge was made more challenging by you know trying something out but we thought hey this this could be cool so eventually we you know drew uh, we designed and drew up a full scale uh, you know system level design as you know shown in the picture on the left and in the picture of the right is the you know uh, more or less design of the turbo pump system we actually got to the point where we successfully performed a hot fire operational test of the engine. And so what that means is that you have your, your, your rocket engine, you put it on a test and it actually um, you know, operates properly. Like uh, you get a uh, flow uh, that's beyond the, uh, that's at several times the speed of sound, you're getting the actual thrust that you need and it actually worked. Um, getting a, a rocket engine uh, as a student organization to you know, operate properly is actually quite a uh, quite a challenge, and not many uh, student groups have even made it that far yet. So, honestly, that's uh, been remarkable. That was remarkable to see that. Um, unfortunately, you know, due to COVID and other factors, uh, the project did get shut down over the course of the last, I believe, year or so. But I mean. If I think about that and reflect on the project, right? I honestly suppose that that's really another part of what being an engineer is. Sometimes, you know, projects don't pan out, and that's okay. You know, what has been fun about is that we can take the learnings uh, from this project and you know apply it to the new opportunities that arise. And just to you know, speak of hot fire testing, I wanted to showcase um, you know, some of the things one of my favorite clubs at Purdue, the Purdue Space Program, does at Zucker Labs. So again, Zucker Labs is the experimental propulsion research facility at Purdue. And again, you know, these students are not much older than you and I are. Um, and again, they're setting up and running an industrial rocket test stand, you know, test stands that again are used for you know, uh, engines at SpaceX or you know, the the US Navy might be sending uh, to Purdue. And it's honestly quite a cool thing to watch. So let me share that uh, video real quick with Rhea. Um, copy. 
and <laughs> let's go there. I will be up in a in a moment. Sounds good. Society are having a competition to launch a bipropellant rocket to 45,000 feet. This competition is unique because we're using liquid propellants. Only about two schools have actually flown liquid propellant rockets before. Liquids, you have to worry about pressure drops, there's a lot of plumbing, there's a lot of valves, a lot of pressurization. Liquid oxygen and methane, which is a relatively new experimental fuel source. There isn't a lot of data on it, but there is a lot of interest in it because technically, theoretically, if we get to Mars, they may have a lot of methane. So if you could turn that into liquid methane on the surface, you could potentially build rocket fuel while there. You can't really get liquid methane anywhere commercially, uh, so we're actually going to condense our own methane on the pad. So the rocket is about 12 feet tall, it's about six and a half inch diameter, and will weigh 120 pounds at liftoff. Uh, this rocket's all made out of carbon fiber and, and aluminum, and this will be on a launch pad. Uh, the launch pad's on a trailer, has a 30 foot uh, rail it's going to go up on. And that launch pad has all our fueling equipment and a data acquisition system. So from the bunker, we'll be in about 200 feet away from when it launches. We can control everything from condensing the methane, fueling the rocket, and launching the rocket. Here at Zucro, which is the propulsion lab here at Purdue, is the largest propulsion lab in the country at any university. They actually kind of specialize in these sorts of propellants and these sorts of motors. So we've had a lot of help and a lot of test stands that have already been set up that we can just kind of modify. And that's something no other school in the country really has right now. We have more area, we have more test cells, it's really quite amazing. And there are just all these parts just kind of lying around from old tests that we can go through, see if they'll still work, see if we can adapt them. In order to test the top fire, it took about 17 hours. Uh, we got here at 7 o'clock in the morning, our advisor was here at 3 in the morning. We flew our locks and our methane through it at pressures to make sure it works. So our hot fire was only four tenths of a second, and in that amount of time we can get all the data we need to make sure our injector works. From May 5th to the 14th, we'll pick a time slot, we'll travel out to Mojave, California, we'll set up, and we'll launch. And we have about two hours during that time to get everything set up and launch, meaning putting up the rail, putting up the rocket, getting everything fueled, and that's going to be a real challenge, but I think we can do it. <laughs> 45,000 feet is an ambitious goal, but uh, our data suggests that it will work. It's really cool, we all like it. Uh, it's a giant problem to solve. There's no handbook on this, so we just start everything from scratch and do it all ourselves. And everyone likes rockets. All right, I know that we're probably getting very uh, short on time right now. So what, but we're pretty much close to the end at this point. So what I wanna do is, uh, let's share, no, no. Uh, da, da, da. Share screen two and uh, from current slide. Let me know if you see my screen, right? So. You can see your screen. Cool. So just, you know, a couple things, right? Um, Nate, this a couple of pieces of advice I'd give. Um, honestly, like once you're in college, right, you know, join student orgs, technical design teams, um, a lot of you probably already uh, know some of this stuff. Um, the reason for this, I think, is, again, this is going to give you opportunities to learn things that you won't in class. But perhaps more importantly than that, It'll help you uh, build relationships with uh, a lot of other bright, motivated students who really are going to be the future of the industry with you. As one of my uh, aerospace professors said, um, you know, your 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 friends and your classmates are going to be your professional network, uh, you know, uh, in your careers. And you know, 30 and 40 years from now, you know, they're going to be leading the industry with you. So forming those relationships and you know learning uh, 
a lot of cool stuff about aerospace and really engineering in general. Uh, um, uh, a lot of that happens in, you know, student orgs and technical design projects that are happening in college. Talk to your professors. Uh, honestly, like once you leave uh, uh, high school, there's no Harkness in college. So professors won't talk to you unless you actually reach out first. And to be honest, you know, if you're re interested in their research or you have questions or anything, really tell them like you're you're not bothering them at all. They really love talking about their research with engaged students. They could like tell you stuff, you know, for hours, um, even if you had you know, a basic question and it's awesome. Um, but take the time to actually talk to your professors and just as you know, in Exeter, right? Don't be afraid to ask questions. And this is a lesson that applies, you know, in school, in industry, like just for the rest of your lives. You know, the best students and professionals are the ones who know their gaps in knowledge, their limitations, right? They ask questions and they put in the effort to learn. It's a lot like the idea that uh, there's someone who's the smartest person in the room usually isn't quite true. And a lot of times what you'll find out is that a lot of... Uh, the big challenging problems are stuff that you have to work on together because everyone is trying to figure it out together. Also, and I, I say this because I remember uh, senior year at Exeter, senior fall, especially where I was uh, very anxious about whether or not I would get into, you know, MIT or Stanford or, you know, Columbia or uh, when I was uh, applying, right? If I'm being very, very honest, um, it, you don't really need to get into the quote unquote best college to have a great career. And to be honest, once you really get to some, of, uh, once you really get into engineering school, you'll find that there isn't that big of a difference uh, in education when you go to one place or another. Um, you know, the physics and math, all the courses you take in undergrad will be pretty much the same. Last I checked, you know, the gravitational uh, acceleration in Boston, Massachusetts, about 9.8 meters per second. It's the same. Uh, at Purdue, maybe it's a millionth of a percent different, but you know, you're know you still going to round up to about the same. Um, you'll get a lot of career and academic opportunities pretty much at any school you go to. MIT might have some opportunities that you don't get at Purdue. Purdue might have some opportunities that you won't get at MIT. That's kind of how this stuff works. But really on the net, um, you're not going to have a worse shot by really going at one place or another. You know, and again, really good students, to be honest, would be just as successful at any other school. And having been on the other side myself, uh, you know, being in industry and talking to uh, professionals who have been around uh, actually since the Apollo era, right? Um, companies and graduate programs recognize this. I don't get asked what uh, college I went to. Uh, mostly at this point, it's just about what sort of things I know how I communicate with people and what sort of uh, work I do. And so that actually goes into the last bit of advice that I might give, at least for this presentation, right? To be honest, um, you guys all have pretty much all the fundamental skills you need to become successful in college and in your careers. Um, again, uh, what Exeter has taught you uh, in a very like bullet point way, right? Effective time management, effective communication, independent study, perseverance and grit. The same stuff that, you know, helps you survive, uh, you know, your 333 uh, in upper year is going to get you through college quite easily. Um, I mean, it is really interesting to see uh, all the skills and fundamentals that, you know, I mastered by the time I graduated Exeter, right? A lot of college students are actually learning this stuff uh, in their freshman year. So you have a massive head start um, uh, uh, when you get to college. And again, like a lot of these skills are pretty much just going to serve you for the rest of your life. Uh, so really, to be honest, uh, I'd say that my last uh, point would be you guys are going to do fine. Uh, so all that's left for you really is to learn the content for whatever pursuits uh, you want to go for going forward, you know, form relationships uh, with people, your peers, professors, and all that whenever you have the chance, and really just have fun with it. Because again, y'all are going to do great. Um, again, I want to, you know, 
take the opportunity to just thank um, you know Ria, Isabella, the Vertex team for inviting me, and thanks for you know sticking around, uh, especially being patient with me with all these uh, technical issues over the course of the hour. And I suppose if you guys have any questions, thoughts, um, things you want to talk about, um, now is a great time. First of all, for my part, thank you so much for your enthusiasm for your work in aerospace and for the Exeter community. It's absolutely incredible. And I hope I will be equally as enthusiastic once I graduate. Yeah. Um, so I guess one question I got, we have, some, we, have time, we have time for a few questions is, Sure. what do you see as the next leap forward in aerospace engineering following autonomous flight? Oh, man. Um, again, there's so many uh, big leaps forward that it's, really hard to say. Um, I'd say that um, it it almost is just impossible to believe that this is going to be the case, but I do think that, you know, within the next few generations, uh, the, the whole idea of a cis lunar economy, right? It's a buzzword that's tossed around uh, here and there. Um, the idea that um, we're going to actually build a lasting presence in space and um you know especially like moon mars the asteroid belt all of that is actually happening so you know we're making strides in terms of you know uh, mining asteroids uh from the asteroid belt we are a few years away from potentially making a more permanent lunar base in uh actually the chinese are working on this the americans are working on this um there's um, work being done to build basically a more ambitious version of the International Space Station in the sort of intermediary zone between the lunar orbit and the Martian orbit. So basically you could have a sort of pit stop that astronauts would take uh, in between these two areas. And that's just, you know, in space, like in terms of aircraft, right? We're getting to a point where we're legitimately making hybrid and electric aircraft that can actually um, uh, fly and basically fly sustainably from an environmental sense and an economic sense. Like regional flight, um, this is more of a maybe mundane thing, but that's, uh, you know, the flights that you might see from like, you know, uh, um, Boston Midway to, you know, Chicago, right? Uh, or sorry, Chicago Midway to like, you know, Boston Logan, right? These relatively small flights they're exploding all over the world and you might as a result see the rise uh the economic like the rise in economic prosperity for a lot of people say in africa um in china india it's expanding in a lot of uh zones of the world where um aviation was not as accessible before and so just as the world is becoming more and more interconnected uh, so far it's only going to get uh more so connected in the future I know that was that was kind of cheating. I was choosing, choosing a lot of different things, but to be honest, there's a lot of stuff going on. That's awesome. Um, one person was asking, would you mind if you could share contact information if they had any questions in the future? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, share that with you uh, after everything is said and done. Perfect. But yeah, feel so, free to talk. Feel free to talk to me whenever. Um, any more questions for anyone? I know that. Um, this is sort of also has a lot of fun Exeter experiences to share if anyone's interested. So feel free to ask anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There, there, there are a couple uh, stories that uh, I remember from Exeter. Um, I think I was telling Diego about uh, one or two. Uh, I'm not, I, I need to think about what I am and I am not uh, allowed to say, but uh, yeah, please go ahead. And really, it could be anything. I would say that um, if I was to pick a favorite D hall, um, it was probably Weatherall. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure why. I think they probably had a better. And actually, no, Elm Street had a better soup bar. I'll say that um, Weatherall, in general, I think had. And I think this might be controversial depending on who you talk. But I think Weatherall had better food than Elm Street did. You know, although there were some times when uh, the principal would make pancakes and for all the students and that was only at Elm Street, but yes, Weatherall is my favorite. 
So I, I could tell you about uh, really a lot of different things at Exeter. Uh, what sort of things would you want to know? Well, okay. there's another question in chat. Um, somebody <laughs> related to Exeter, but I have a question not really. Sure, sure. Exeter. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I should probably introduce myself first. Um, hi, I'm Deborah. Um, hey. I'm the mechanical lead on the FTC team here at Exeter. Um, and as somebody who wants to go into mechanical engineering, um, like what kind of things would you recommend kind of like doing in high school, like reading up on or learning about if you want to go into mechanical engineering? I mean, aerospace. <laughs> I think if I'm being honest, the barrier to entry is not really tremendously that high. So it's not like you need to be a master of, uh, you know, all the fundamentals uh, right as you leave high school. Um, I mean, again, like you, the stuff that you're doing in FTC right now is going to serve you quite well in a future in mechanical engineering. And also just, just uh, to say something, right, even though I said the whole washing machine about the thing about mechanical engineering. Right? To be honest, aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering are pretty much highly overlapping fields. Aerospace engineering is just like in many ways applied mechanical engineering for aircraft and spacecraft. But to really answer your question, I'd say that, you know, um, I'd say that maybe something that um, a lot of engineers uh, don't necessarily appreciate or don't necessarily get as much of an opportunity to learn that I think Exeter students in particular are good at is the value of a more um, well-rounded uh, you know, humanities education, as well as very good effective communication skills, like both verbally and in the written word. And the reason why I say this is because you know, engineering, at least as I've seen it and as I've, uh, uh, at least as I've seen, as I've experienced it, is not really just a scientific field. It kind of is a human one because at the core of it, what you're doing is solving, you know, human problems, environmental problems, just solving a lot of challenges um, using science and technology. And so if you're trying to solve uh, problems for people, it really is important that you understand the people that you're actually uh, working to serve. And so in that respect, I think, to be honest, um, the education at Exeter is, very, is a very good foundation for being uh, a good engineer, at least an engineer that holistically understands the big picture. And again, like a lot of the technical stuff, like it's content that you will learn at college. And it's, I mean, again, like, doing uh, a lot of the stuff that you're doing in Vertex is going to help you a lot. But I, I, what I'm saying is that you don't necessarily, you know, need to think that, oh, you need to do more and more and more from a technical perspective in order to succeed in engineering school. That's not the case. Um, a lot of that opportunity will arrive uh, when you're in college and you'll find yourself uh, being just as, you know, successful as people who are, say, like at a, a STEM school since they were like in second grade. And to answer, uh, um, how do you pronounce your name? Is Nupur or something else? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. No, no, I, I, I'm very particular about that because, you know, as you might imagine, uh, other people might uh, mispronounce my name at times. And so I, I generally just try to ask. Um, I was in Main Street Hall all four years. And I'm hearing some unfortunate news that Main Street might be torn down the next decade, which is uh, honestly uh, kind of disappointing. You know they're going to leave Wentworth up and you know tear Main Street down. This is this is unjust. Oh my gosh! I know they're tearing down Langdell and like Weatherall and Merrill to like renew it, but I didn't know no. they're down Main Street. No, so make West better. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Are they going to keep Ewald up? Because that would actually no, they're not. That that would be a crime. Honestly, if Ewald goes down with us, that might be okay. But if Ewald stays up. <laughs> 
I don't know. I think they're just like the two like northernmost ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's, one more, oh, there's one more question for you in the chat. Um, sent to me sure. about your Exeter experience, and it is, what is the most valuable skill you carried over from Exeter? Um, again, it's probably being able to uh, communicate my ideas effectively, and again, in uh, also being able to take what others are saying and really appreciate the implications of what is being said. Um, Knowledge building in general, and basically, uh, you know, any complicated work that you're doing, there's, again, when I say that the world is too big and complex for anyone to solve alone, that's about right. So, for example, like the, uh, let's take a fighter jet, the F-15 or the F-18, right? It about if if I want to ballpark uh, in terms of the number of people that it takes to actually develop a plane like that, it's about. 50, 60,000 people doing a bunch of different jobs uh, to make something like that possible. There's probably more, uh, for example, that worked on the Apollo missions. Uh, it takes a lot of hands, a lot of minds to come together to make uh, a lot of impossible things possible. And in order to actually like do some of that stuff, you need to understand that other people have valuable things to say that you, in order to actually uh, get anything done, it's not just knowing stuff. You have to actually effectively talk about this stuff and why it matters. And what you get at the end is, you know, a lot of ideas coming together and people, you know, working to sew them together into something interesting. You're making, rather than just like, you know, you know, regurgitating knowledge, you're actually making some new knowledge that is, you know, manifesting itself in the world. So that's probably one of the biggest things that I got from Exeter, just the ability to appreciate that um, really this endeavor of uh, building something new takes, uh, you know, a team of people. And you'll see that the like a lot of the fundamentals of the Harkness table will show up uh, and it's probably cliche. You've probably heard it before. It'll show up in the boardroom table. It'll show up when people are, um, you know, on their third uh, can of Red Bull at 4 a.m. on a Thursday working on, uh, you know, uh, a rocket nozzle. Uh, being able to really, you know, communicate ideas and really listen to what other people are talking about uh, becomes really important. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. Awesome. So I think we we'll run over a little bit, but that that sounds good to me. Um, any final questions? Anything else that people want to ask about Exeter? About I don't know college advice. Literally anything. Oh yeah, yeah, pretty much. Just ask me whatever. What was your favorite course or favorite teacher at Exeter? Oh, ooh. oh man. Um. I won't go with a favorite teacher because um, uh, I'm going to keep that to myself. But I think one of my favorite classes at Exeter was probably uh, Introduction to Western Philosophy by Professor Vorking. Um, it was maybe like one of the first times that I actually like interacted with uh, you know, philosophy in general. And so it was a really interesting class that sort of expanded my mind to really new ways of approaching how I really perceive the world. And so it was a lot of fun. Ooh, that sounds really cool. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. Is Vorking still teaching at Exeter? Sorry, who? Uh, Professor Vorking. I believe he retired last year or the year before. Oh, okay. That's fair. He's been, he was around for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's able to enjoy his retirement. So if that's all, um, thank you so much again, Mr. Roy, for coming. And the presentation was wonderful and exciting for everyone. It, it's great to hear from an Exeter alum about their experiences. Oh, yeah. I'm glad to be here. And again, uh, sorry for uh, my ineptitude with uh, Zoom. It's been, again, it's been a minute since I've used it. So uh, thank you for your patience with me.
Uh, thank you. Thank you. I know, I know someone like, uh, asked it before, but I would like love to have some way to contact you. Because, like, oh no, yeah, I I will um, uh, send uh, contact information to Ria soon after this, and so like if you ever want to uh, talk to me or ask any questions or anything, like please go right ahead. Yes, I'm curious more about and, um, Main Street history and traditions. Yes, uh, <laughs> Alex, I see you're in a loft. Uh, I assume you're also in Main Street. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, sadly, we figured out it's getting torn down because it's sinking into the earth slowly. Ah, uh, wait, wait, hold on. Um, what part of Main Street is that loft in? Is it you go through the the door, like the the side door, right? Like the one where you go up the stairs, the left, that one. Is that the second? Yeah. Room? Shoot. Um, yeah. That, I think that might that might have been my room senior year. Really? <laughs> check check the names on the stairs to see if my name is up there. Like I put it in Sharpie, I think. Ooh, okay. I will. Yeah. That's actually really cool. Yeah. Well now I'll have to leave my name too. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean it not that it might amount to anything in 10 years, it might disappear, but you know, hey. We might be able to keep it a while longer. Yeah. Rage against the dying of the light. Yep. I also awesome. would love to have the contact information. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. No problem. All right, thank you. It was really nice to hear this. It was really fun. Oh yeah, like yeah. glad thank to be you. here. Yeah, no problem. All right, see you guys.